Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. I've told a lot of stories about game development, but today I actually want to talk about process. Specifically, how I make my design documents. I want to talk both about the order I do them and what actually each one contains. So most of this applies to the original IP that I've made. But it can work for other games. I mean, I've made D&D and Vampire. But this is the process I go through when I'm creating an IP from scratch. And I want to write documents because I know once we get a team attached, people are going to want to know answers to a lot of things. So when I do my documentation for a new game, I always do them in a very particular order. I always start with setting, and then I do story, and then I do system. So they all begin with S's. But the reason I do it that way is setting kind of defines the space in which the game will be. The story is a very high level description of what every player will experience going through it. It's sort of the main, they will help define the main story quests even if there are multiple solutions to go through, going through those quests. And then finally, I make the system mechanics because it's important to do that last so that you have mechanics that support things you've said in the first two documents. If you have system mechanics that are completely unconnected uh, to your setting or your story, you probably haven't made good system mechanics. So let's go into each one of these documents because they they're they're not only very different documents but they're intended for different people and they're written differently so for the first one the setting this is something that will often be one of the first things that a publisher whoever's going to give you money will see so i try to make that setting describable in a sentence or two it's often called the elevator pitch you want to be evocative you want people to be interested in this setting you want to come up with a setting that is easy to put stories in and easy to make quests for. Um, one of the reasons I always thought um, that the games that Troika made were so evocative were they were all placed in settings where there was a lot of player agency. There was a lot of things players could do. And that basically means you can't have a setting that's too authoritarian, uh, that has too much law. Um, you can do it, but you want to make sure that there's some kind of room for the player to move around in. Most of the settings I've ever made could be described as, here's a thing that's very easy to explain. Oh, but there's a twist. I think that that helps people understand what you're making, and the twist makes them go, oh, and this is why it's original. And then the twist can be used and explored to see what would happen well, if the, with this difference, what what how would this setting be different than other settings that have come before? So let me give you some examples. So for Fallout, when we have finally arrived on a post-apocalyptic setting, we wanted it to be different. And Leonard's idea of making it 50s inspired was itself inspirational because the 50s predicted a lot of things about you know, if a nuclear war happened, if the Cold War exploded into a hot war, the they predicted radiation everywhere, mutations, monsters, gangs of people, robots going crazy. And these were all things we put in Fallout. Just that alone, without even talking about the story, you already have an idea. Oh, yeah, I think I know what this game will be like. We did the same thing for Arcanum. Um, when Leonard and Jason and I sat down, we were just saying, what do we want to make? And we had made Fallout because we didn't want to make a fantasy game. So now that we felt like, well, we, we deserve our own shot to make a fantasy game. We didn't want it to be standard. And the idea was, what if a very standard fantasy world, very Lord of the Rings, very, you know, you got your elves and your dwarves and magic and all that. What if an industrial revolution happened? Because every fantasy game seems mired in the 14th century. Like, they have wagons and water wheels maybe very, very primitive guns, and then everything stops right there, as if all that stuff would be invented and then invention stopped. So we said, what if tech kept going and kept going and magic and tech started conflicting? So that's how we came up with that setting. And then settings like that 
sort of lead you into what the story could be. The make sure I've got, I made notes on this because I'm like, I want to make sure I cover everything. You want to make sure that your story makes sense within the setting you just defined. Yes, the setting is very evocative, but you want the story to be something that people actually want to do. It lets players explore the setting. You, you want, And you want them to be able to create whatever player character they want. And that's important for me. A lot of games don't do that. But for me, if you're really an RPG, don't assign me a character. Don't assign me a role. Don't even... And if you name the character for me, you're probably going already have lost me. I want to make somebody who's my conception, and then I want to play my character in your world. And your job is to react to it. So examples for that were, again, we're to look at Fallout and Arcanum. And Fallout, what was great is we had this vault which had been sealed. So neither the vault dwellers nor you, the player, knew what was outside. You just knew it was some radioactive hellscape. The nice thing about what we, how we set it up, where there was an emergency, the water chip was a complete MacGuffin, of course. We just needed to get a reason to get you out of the vault. The fact that you could make any character you wanted was supported by the story element that the vault dweller to leave was picked by lot at random. Nobody wanted to go out. People who had gone out before had never returned, so you knew it was dangerous. But by selecting them at random, that let the player make any kind of character they wanted. In fact, if you make a dumb character, you might go, why in the world did the vault send out this idiot? Well, you were selected at random. They probably went, okay, we'll give this guy two weeks and then we're going to do another lottery. That probably what was happening, but somehow you were successful. But I love that. I love that the player could make any character he wanted and going out to look for the water ship and then he gets involved in something much bigger which is the survival of the vault itself beyond getting water we did a very similar thing in arcanum our our fiction was that you were a character taking an airship to a new continent looking for work there was rumor that there was all this work to be had in the in this great new city tarant and then the airship is shot down by orcs flying biplanes. It's just, it was, it was crazy. You're like, I don't know what this is. And you suddenly get caught up in something bigger. And we actually made fun of the trope where you were the chosen one because Virgil thinks you're the chosen one, but you think he's crazy. But I, again, we did that. You made any character you wanted. You have a reason to be involved in something really big, but it's not at all what you expected. And again, Arcana was completely open world. We let you go in any direction you wanted, explore the setting any way you wanted. No matter what direction you went in, we had quests and storylines we wanted you to experience. So that gives me brings me to the third thing, which are systems. The systems, are, it's really important that the systems you make support your setting, both in tone and in actual mechanics reinforcing what you've just told the player the setting is like. So in Fallout, it was really important to have combat skills, because the Wasteland is dangerous, stealth skills, dialogue skills. You basically did not know what you were going to encounter. So we gave you all these tools in your player character toolbox to deal with it. And then on top of that, we put in things like radiation, because of course you're going to handle radiation. We threw in lots of drugs, because that was just something that this setting would have all these drugs to deal with things like healing and radiation and dealing with poison, and just all the things that we're going to happen to you in the wasteland. Arcanum was a very similar thing. Yes, we put in spells and we put in text schematics for you to learn because this was a that was what the setting included. But we also put in the meter that had your magic and tech because we wanted magic versus tech to be reflected right there on your character sheet. Yes, there was a greater cultural war going on between these two factions, but the war was also going on on your very character sheet. Every time you decided to take a spell, that meter went ding, towards magic. And then you learned a schematic, whoop, over there towards tech. And you had to think about that. Every time you bought something, you had to think, do I want to move my meter? This was something that involves the player in a very direct way to the setting you just made. Now, something that I think is very important to put in your system design docs, which is something that you probably didn't need in your setting or story, where every mechanic you put in should have a goal 
or set of goals listed at the top of the page. These can range from really high level goals to very specific goals. And I'm not talking about goals like let the player have fun because that should that should just be a given. I'm talking about why is this particular mechanic being included in the game? You need to justify it. I, this time I'm not going to use Fallout or Arcade. I'm going to use Outer Worlds as an example. So we had melee and ranged as completely separate skills. And one of our high-level goals was melee and range combat should feel different and offer substantially different play experiences, but neither one should be significantly more powerful than the other. To some of you, that may go, well, duh. But that was something that I wanted to state because I wanted to make sure that anything that got designed by other designers in the, in the game supported that high-level goal. Which meant when we did the page on melee combat, there was a goal specifically for melee that wasn't for range. It said melee combat needs to be simple and easily accessible for casual players, but have higher skill maneuvers for advanced players. So then when we were doing our melee combat, we made the conscious choice that melee, when you swung a melee weapon, if the target you swung at was in, was in range of that melee weapon and in the arc you were fa in the arc that you were facing, it always hit. You did not roll to hit. If I swing a baseball bat at you and you're in front of me, I hit you with that baseball bat. The skill determined how much damage you did. And this was very different than ranged. When I shot a gun, the skill determined whether or not I hit at all. But then when I hit, it did damage within the range of the weapon. So that right away made melee and ranged feel different. Then we added additional melee techniques. We added like power attack and sweep attack. So if you were playing, so casual players could just pick up a baseball bat and go boom, boom, I'm hitting the thing in front of me, boom, boom, boom. Advanced players were like, oh, this would be a good time to do a sweep attack because there's three monsters in front of me. Or my baseball bat isn't doing much damage against this robot's armor. I'm going to do a power attack and try to override the, the, the armor's defense. The fact that we had written these goals explicitly into all the design system mechanic pages from the top to the bottom meant that when we discussed these system mechanics, we could separate our discussions into does this mechanic achieve the goal we set out to do versus I don't think that's a good goal. I've found many people when they start to when they disagree with something, whether it's another designer, someone else on the development team, people who play your game later, or even reviewers, they often don't separate these things. They don't go, well, this game did a good job of doing this, but I wish they hadn't done this. We needed to do that because when you're developing a game, if your fellow developers don't agree with your goals, that is a very different discussion than whether your individual design elements achieve those goals. And you should have that discussion first and get everybody to either agree that these are good goals or at least the very minimum agree that these are the goals you're going to try to achieve. If you don't have that, and I've worked on a few teams that don't have that, things will go bad for you. People will be making different games on the same team. I feel like I got very lucky with Fallout and Arcanum that we were all making the same game. Later on, at Carbine and Obsidian, I often saw people not working on the same game goals. And by the way, this goal idea, this wasn't mine. I got this from Josh Sawyer. When I worked with him on Pillars, that was something he was doing. And I was like, this is brilliant. It's sort of like, I've always done this implicitly, but Josh explicitly wrote those goals down at the top of the pages. And I thought that was brilliant. I'm like, I'm stealing that. That's good. You guys should steal it too. Josh is a very good system mechanic designer. So the other reason to do this explicit goals so you can have these discussions and you can know that you're talking about, do you not like this particular mechanic or do you not like the goal of this mechanic? Is if you go into design, something you have to realize is that everybody on your team, in management, 
who will play your game and will review your game thinks that they're a game designer. They're not, but they think they are. And that means as a game designer, you will get feedback that programmers and artists don't ever get. No one ever walks up to a programmer and says, yeah, I was playing the game and it's pretty obvious you're using quick sort. You really should be using insertion sort. Go back in there and change that. No one ever goes up to a, an artist and said, hey, I was playing your game and some of the animations looked a little stiff, so I redid all the animations. Here they are. You should put them in your channels. No one does that. Now, of course, don't get me wrong. I've been a programmer. I know what kind of stuff they deal with. They come over like, your bugs, your game is, your code is buggy. Fix it. Also, I know art, people come up to artists and say the most unconstructive things. Like, I don't like that. Thanks. That's really constructive. Which, as a side note, if you give feedback that isn't constructive, your feedback is worthless. I know that sounds harsh, but it is. If you give unconstructive feedback, you might as well not be saying anything. If you just look at something and go, that's stupid, or I don't like that, that's worthless feedback. Nobody can do anything with that feedback. They're not going to start throwing darts against the wall until you say, oh, okay, I like that. You have to say something more. And that's why, at least for design, because it's almost all written before the game is made, having these goals in place in your system mechanics design let you have much more constructive discussions than just people going, yeah, I don't like that melee weapons always hit. Okay, that's how we're making the distinction between melee and range. How would you make that distinction? That is a very different response to give them than, okay, thanks for that comment. Have a nice day. So that, in a nutshell, is how I do my design processes. Story, setting story system, in the system goals on every page. I think if you do things in that order and you, you follow those guidelines, I think you will have a much more productive system design experience. Thank you.